section 19.5 capacitors and dielectrics. So a parallel plate capacitor we've seen before at this point, it consists of two metal plates, one that carries charge positive Q and the other that carries charge negative Q. That's what's shown here, right? We have a positive Q and a negative Q and each of the plates has an area A and a plate separation that we're now going to call D is the distance between the two plates. We also could attach a voltmeter, something that measures the electric potential difference between two points, and we could find that electric potential difference between the two plates, or the voltage between the two plates is a term we're going to start using next chapter. So whenever we have a capacitor like this, there's a relationship, it turns out, between the amount of charge stored on the plates and the electric potential difference between those two plates. So the relation between charge and potential difference for a capacitor is given by this, Q is equal to C times V. Magnitude of the charge on each plate is directly proportional to the magnitude of the potential difference between the plates. C is the capacitance. So a capacitor has capacitance and it's a proportionality constant. It's specific to the geometry of the capacitor plates. So the SI unit of capacitance is going to be, if we rearrange this to solve for C, we could see that the capacitance is equal to Q divided by V. So the units of Q are going to be our coulombs and the units of V of our electric potential are volts. So we have coulombs per volt. And that's something that we define as the farad, which is a capital F. So that's the unit of capacitance. So there's a brief introduction into the relationship between charge and potential difference for a capacitor. Now, it's common once you have a capacitor to fill the region between the plates with an electrically insulating material known as a dielectric. So in A, we have a capacitor with nothing in between it. So the electric field lines just go straight across. If we add a dielectric in the middle, then it's insulating, but it can get some slight polarization where there's a slightly negative end closer to the positive plate, a slightly more positive surface charge next to the negative one. That means that the dielectric takes some of the electric field at the surface and it reduces the electric field inside the dielectric. But the advantage of adding the dielectric is that it can increase the capacitance of your capacitor. So that's a convenient thing. Now we define the dielectric with something known as the dielectric constant. And that's the ratio of the electric field with no dielectric, E0, divided by the electric field inside the dielectric. If you look at the difference in the lines, there are, there's much more electric field without the dielectric. Once you're inside the dielectric, the lines are cut in about half, depending on the dielectric itself. So what that means is that with this ratio for a kappa, the dielectric constant, the uh, electric field without a dielectric will always be greater than the other electric field. So kappa will always be greater than or equal to one, right? It's possible to be the same, but it's not going to be less than one. So we can look at some examples of the dielectric constant kappa. This is something that you can look up in a table given the material. So vacuum is basically, you haven't put a dielectric in between. Air is very nearly a vacuum. It's basically, there's nothing in between the two plates, but you can add some other materials like Teflon or paper or water. It turns out has a very large dielectric constant. It's able to have quite an effect on the electric field by adding water in between the plates. All right, and here we have those labeled for us with the same figure. So if we want to find the capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor, we're going to start with two different equations here. One is our definition of the dielectric constant that's equal to the electric field inside um, without a dielectric and the electric field inside the dielectric. The other equation we can start with is we can go back to our electric field is equal to 
negative delta V all over delta S. And what we're going to do here is we're going to have the negative, and then we'll say that one of the plates, it's at a potential of zero, and then the other plate is at negative V, and the distance between the plates, delta S, is just D. And so that allows us to write the electric field between the plates of a parallel plate capacitor is just the potential difference between the plates, the electric potential divided by D. So both of these equations go into this first line. For the other one, it was solved for the electric field. So these, uh, the electric field and kappa switch places. So either way, it's electric field is equal to electric field. And that's thus that the electric field without the dielectric divided by the dielectric constant is equal to the potential divided by the separation between the plates. Now, we've already seen the electric field in our classic parallel plate capacitor last chapter. We saw that that electric field was given by the amount of charge on the plates divided by epsilon naught divided by the area. So we can substitute that in here. So we would have Q over epsilon naught over the area. We're also dividing by um, kappa, the dielectric constant, and that's all equal to V all over D. Now, if we want to solve for Q, then we will multiply everything else across to the top, and that's what's shown here. Q is equal to kappa times epsilon naught times the area divided by the separation between the plates times V. And if we group the parentheses like so, we can see that everything in parentheses could be described by the C in our original equation that Q is equal to C times V. So that's why we grouped the things as we did. And that tells us then that the capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor that has a dielectric in it is just given by this equation. The dielectric constant times the permittivity of free space times the area of the plates divided by the separation between said plates. So note the capacitance is just set by the geometry, right? The area of the plates, how far apart they are, and if you have a dielectric there. It, the capacitance doesn't have anything to do with how much charge is on the plates or how much electric potential is on the plates. So you can change the dielectric or you can change the other parts of the geometry. That's the only way you can change the capacitance. All right, so let's try an example. The effect of a dielectric when a capacitor has a constant charge. An empty capacitor is connected to a battery and charged up. The capacitor is then disconnected from the battery and a slab of dielectric material is inserted between the plates. Does the voltage across the plates increase, decrease, or remain the same? Right, this one will take some thinking. So I encourage you to think it through, come up with an answer, and pause the video until you're ready to go on. All right, hoping you have your answer now. So what do we have here? The capacitor is charged up while it's empty. When it's charged up, what is being charged? Well, the plates are receiving their amount of charge, right? The negative Q and the positive Q. That's set by the battery. So the battery sets those values of Q so that Q is now set. That's how the descriptions mentions constant charge. OK. But now we add a slab of dielectric material between the plates. So if we add a slab of dielectric material, what are we changing? We're now changing our dielectric constant. Where before, it was probably 1 because it was a vacuum or it was air. But now, if we have a some dielectric material other than air, which if it's a slab, it has to be something else, the kappa, the kappa is going to be greater than 1. We know that our capacitance is proportional to that dielectric constant. So if the dielectric constant increases, our capacitance must also increase. Now let's go back to that relationship we have between charge and capacitance and electric potential. So Q is equal to C times V. The C is going to increase. And so might be tempting at this point to say, okay, so the potential will also increase. But remember, the charge was already set by the battery. So the charge has to stay the same. 
If we need the charge to stay the same while the capacitance increases, that means our electric potential is going to need to decrease. So this might seem a little strange, but that's why we have to go through step by step and see what stays constant and what changes. And that's how we can figure this thing out. All right, let's check out a less conceptual example, something with numbers. So a computer keyboard. One common kind of computer keyboard, looks like a classic keyboard, is based on the idea of capacitance. Each key is mounted on one end of a plunger, the other end being attached to a movable metal plate. The movable plate and the fixed plate form a capacitor. When the key is pressed, the capacitance increases because you've decreased the plate separation. The change in capacitance is detected, thereby recognizing the key that has been pressed. So if we have two keys and the separation between the plates is five millimeters, but is reduced to 0.15 millimeters when a key is pressed, the plate area is 9.5 times 10 to the minus five square meters, and the capacitor is filled with a material whose dielectric constant is 3.5. Again, that's greater than one, which is what we'd expect for a dielectric. Determine the change in capacitance as detected by the computer. So we know our capacitance is equal to the dielectric constant times permittivity of free space times the area and divided by the separation. So we have that as a reference here. All we have to figure out is what these different values are. So separation between the plates, remember that's our D, so we can call that D1, because we also have a later D that's 0.15 meters, so we'll call that D2. Then it mentions this plate area. Does the plate area change when you push a key down? No, the plate areas stay the same. They're just getting closer together. And finally, we have the dielectric constant, 3.5, so that's going to be our kappa. So here's a question. If we want to find the change in capacitance of C2 minus C1, can we just subtract D2 minus D1? Can we just get the difference between the plates and plug it into this equation? Well, not quite. Because it's in the denominator, that doesn't work so well. So we need to find each of the individual capacitances, the capacitance when the separation is five, the capacitance when the separation is 0.15, and then we can subtract them from each other, and then we will get the answer that we expect. So let's take a look at that. All right, so we have capacitance, uh, this would be capacitance two, as our previous labeling is kappa epsilon naught A over D, right, and we have this D2 down below, but everything else is the same, and that comes out to 19.6 times 10 to the minus 12 farads. We can do the same thing with capacitance one when it's a larger separation, and because it's a larger separation in the denominator, that's a smaller capacitance. So our final change in capacitance will be the difference of subtracting C2 minus C1. So that comes out to 19.0 times 10 to the minus 12 farads. So there's uh, some keyboarding in action. It's just using capacitors. And you can calculate how that change in capacitance is something that can be detected. OK, a couple more things to mention with a capacitor. Something that matters a lot with capacitors is the energy storage. Because capacitors, it turns out, can store a lot of energy. And more importantly, they can release that energy in a short amount of time. So the amount of energy a capacitor can store is one half the capacitance times the potential difference squared. So that's one way you can just calculate the energy right off. You can use your Q is equal to capacitance times electric potential to write this in terms of other quantities, right? Uh, if instead of wanting capacitance in there, you can say, hey, capacitance is equal to Q over V Right, so we could plug that into this equation and we'd find that it's one half Q over V times V squared. So one of the V's would cancel. And we could calculate the energy with one half Q times V. You could do the same thing of eliminating the V and having it in terms of capacitance and charge. So this relationship is really essential anytime you're talking about capacitors. 
Now, rather than doing that, we're going to try and write this in terms of some other quantities to ultimately get to energy density. So we can note that our capacitance, as we just discussed, is kappa epsilon, not the area, divided by the separation between the plates. We can also write that electric potential as the electric field times D, right? Remembering that the electric field of a capacitor is equal to the electric potential divided by D. So if we solve for the electric potential by multiplying D across, it tells us that V is equal to E times D. Here it is a, uh, the whole thing is squared, so we need to remember that. But one of those Ds is going to cancel. So we don't need to worry about the uh, second D there. And if we take the area times the distance between the plates, right, knowing that we have the plates on either side, the area, and then the distance between them, that's going to describe all the sides to give you the volume. Volume is length times width, which is area, times height, which is here the separation between the plates. So we could instead write this as 1 half kappa times epsilon naught times the volume, which I'm going to write out volume so that we don't confuse it with electric potential, because they do look very similar, times all that we have left here is the E squared. So that's another way we can calculate energy. And more importantly, we can calculate energy density if we divide both sides by the volume. Energy density is energy divided by volume. And so the volume would cancel out. And all that we'd be left with is 1 half kappa epsilon naught times the electric field squared. So both of these equations are useful if you're interested in the energy within a capacitor. And as mentioned, that energy can be very large and it can discharge very rapidly. And that's something that's used in the medical field with a defibrillator, right? So there's two metal plates. These are the charged plates of a capacitor. So they charge up, right? And then when it discharges, there is a large amount of energy that passes from one plate to the other through someone's heart and that can jump their heart back into gear. So capacitors are really important. They're in every electronic you have. But here's one example that you may have seen, especially if you're interested in the medical field. So this brings us to the end of all of the lecture content of chapter 19, where we took a look at electric potential energy, the electric potential, and a closer look at capacitors. So hope you are fully charged up now. And uh, yeah, lots of good stuff to be had here.